Amen. Well, church, let me, uh, man, this is so great. Let me ask you to turn to the book of Luke. Luke chapter one. Yes, we're starting. Today's the day. We may never get out. It's so good. It's so glorious. You could pray for your pastor, but the word is bottomless, you guys. So rich. I've been dying to get into this. Luke chapter one, uh, beginning in verse one. We're just going to read to verse four today. This is the word of the Lord. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You could be seated. Church, good morning. So great to be with you this morning. Uh, if you cannot tell, I am fired up to be in this book. And I know you've mostly read it before, right? Oh, I've read Luke before. I've read Luke before. Now, you're going to be floored by Luke again, all right? So none of this, like, lack of anticipation. God is going to meet us in his word. I have read Luke before as well, <laughs> okay? And God is wrecking me again with the glory of Jesus Christ, and we are going to just have, I think, the most amazing next <clears throat> almost three years. <sighs> And we're titling this series, guys, Looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. Why? Why? Why Luke? This is the title of the message. You want to go back to one. We'll get to the main slide, Looking to Jesus. Let me just break this down for a second before we get into the actual title of the message. You go, why Luke, right? That's one of the questions that comes up. Why Luke? And the answer is because we need to get our eyes on Jesus. That's why. Because as a people, as Christians, you and I need to be constantly returning to the one who loves our souls. We need Jesus. Octavius Winslow, who was a contemporary of Charles Spurgeon, has become a minister and mentor to my own heart, one of those dead guys on my shelf that has just ministered to my soul, said, here's a very easy way to test a man's religion. What do you think about Jesus? Now, categories he would give, but the question is simple enough that that should be something we ask ourselves all the time. What do you think about Jesus? What does your heart think about Jesus? Let me give you some categories. Is his righteousness that which exalts you out of and above yourself and daily gives you free and near access to God? Is the sweetness of his love much in your heart and the fragrance of his name on your lips? Are your daily corruptions carried to his grace, your guilt to his blood, and your trials to his heart? In a word, is Jesus the substance of your life? Is he the source of your sanctification? Is he the one glorious object on which your eye is ever resting and the mark towards which you are ever pressing? Is he, church? Because, loved ones, he must be. And my prayer in this series is as we get our eyes back on Jesus, he would be for you in an ever-increasing manner. Oh, that God would sweeten to our souls our communion with Jesus Christ. Remember, it was Jesus who said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it is they that testify about me. So as we come to the word of God, we come to see Jesus, amen? So this is my ask for you. You would come every week expectant. 
you would come hopeful. None of this, I didn't get anything out of the sermon. That is on you, bro. (laughs) That is on you. Come ready to learn. Come applying the truths. And let's see if in three years when this finishes-ish, we're not closer to Jesus. All right? Now let's put that title up. Title of today's message, that you may have certainty. That you may have certainty. Not every New Testament book contains a purpose statement. So when one does, like the book of Luke, you got to take notice of it. You got to be aware of it. You ought to pay attention to it. And that purpose statement finds itself in chapter 1, verse 4. We just read it. What is Luke trying to accomplish? That Theophilus, and by extension, those who would read this work written to Theophilus, would have certainty concerning the things you have been taught, implied, about Jesus. So as we get out of the gates here, what I want to say is there's no secret here. Like, is he trying to woo us to Jesus? Is he trying to, like, persuade us to come to Jesus? Uh, Yeah, he is. And he's not, like, hiding it. You know, sometimes, like, people play these religious games. You're like, I think I'm getting sucked into this, like, religious vortex of this Christian who's trying to share the gospel. Let's just be clear, Christians. We are trying to suck you in to that vortex, all right? We want you to know Jesus. It's a pretty amazing vortex if you could get sucked into it. Luke is crystal clear. He's trying to persuade you of the truth as it is in Jesus and that Jesus, because of that truth, guys, is worthy of believing in. That is the entire reason for the book of Luke. And so it leads us to our big idea for today. The big idea of today is that Luke's gospel was written to convince you that Jesus is who the apostles said he was and the one who fulfills the whole of the Old Testament. That's for today, and that's for every message between now and Easter of 2026. You're welcome, by the way. That was me, like, coming down a bit, because we could have just gone. But I know we got to get to some stuff. That's why I got, I'm trying to preach the whole Bible eventually. Wouldn't that be cool? All right, so Luke's gospel, I I did that, by the way, so you could write things down. Did you see that? You see that? I saw all the faces were here. Luke's gospel is written to convince you that Jesus is who the apostles said he was. In other words, what you have in your Bible is the truth. Don't let the atheist, don't let the agnostic tell you that's just a book of man's musings about religion. Eh, Wrong, it's not true. Luke's gonna prove that to us. But Luke's going to go beyond that as a Gentile writer, no less, to show you that Jesus is the fulfillment of the whole of the Old Testament. I'm going to give you a little taste of that today. Remember back in the late 90s, at least it was for me the late 90s, there was like a big apologetics push. And uh, so Lee Strobel, do you remember Lee Strobel? Right, and he wrote the case for Christ, and then he wrote the case for a bunch of other things that I don't know the names of, faith and a creator and all that stuff. And do you remember Josh McDowell was involved in that as well? Did anyone read that book, More Than a Carpenter? I remember the day that More Than a Carpenter just absolutely flattened me with the weight of what Josh McDowell was bringing forth. Because Josh McDowell, I think, was, was he like an atheist, right? Of like, he was a lawyer by background, so smart dude who was an atheist who was like, you know what, I hear people talking about Jesus all the time. I'm just going to study it, investigate it, and put this thing to rest so I never have to worry about this Jesus thing ever. And in studying and investigating, look at the historicity, the manuscripts, etc., he comes to an overwhelming confidence that Jesus is, is who the apostles said he was. And I remember the day after reading that book that I felt like God had just put steel in my spine. Like I had this confidence and this convictional belief that Jesus Christ is the son of God and the one worthy of our lives. Now that was more than a carpenter written by a lawyer 2,000 years later. I want you to understand what you have in your hand is written by a physician who was also a brilliant man who went to first hand accounts, primary sources, not secondary sources, primary sources to investigate the claims about Jesus. In other words, they were alive. Yep, was there, saw that happen. That's what you hold in your hands. So don't read it anything less than a profound historical account 
of the life, death, burial, and resurrection and exaltation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God for sinners like us. Obviously, Luke is trying to get us to confidence. Obviously, he's trying to help us, help, help us to stand convinced. And so we want to look at that subject today. And the points are going to follow that pattern. Stand convinced. That's the goal. Luke wants you to stand convinced. I want you to stand convinced. And we're going to look at four verses, four points today, as he sets up this work to convince us of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Four considerations. Number one, stand convinced by the historicity of Luke's gospel. Stand convinced by the historicity of Luke's gospel. I want you guys to come with me as we investigate these four verses by taking kind of a Let's not call it a 30,000 foot view because there's not that many verses here, but let's call it a 10,000 foot view. Let's get up over these four verses before we look at them in depth. And what I want you to understand about these four verses is that these four verses are one long sentence in the Greek. Now, interestingly, not written in Koine Greek or common Greek, but written in literary classical Greek, this prologue, these four verses. Now you say, oh my goodness, you're not going to read like a commentary to me, are you today? Please don't do that, Pastor Scott. I don't want to be bored. No, there's a reason I'm telling you this. You have to understand historically all of the greats of history, when they wanted their work to be legitimized as something that should stand the test of time on the shelf amongst the greats of history, literary works of history, the Josephuses of the world, the Thucydides of the world, when they wanted to make a statement, would write in that classical literary Greek that Luke uses here. Luke is the only one of the gospel writers who does this in the prologue. And he's doing this for a very specific reason because he's essentially so fired up, so convinced about what he has investigated that he's saying, I am putting the gospel more, I am putting Christianity on the stage of world history saying this should be a work of literature that should stand the test of time next to the great of the great of the greats. He was boldly laying this out. Now, here's the other thing about Luke that I love. Luke was a Gentile. Do we know of any other Gentile writers in the New Testament? Luke, while writing to the most educated and establishing this gospel as a historically verifiable account that should stand the test of time on the bar of the greatest of the greats of world history, wrote the rest from verse 5 all the way to the end of the book in common Greek. Why? Because while he was putting this historical account of Jesus on the world stage, he also believed it was for the world so that it wasn't meant to go merely to the rich and to the educated, but it was meant to go to the poor. And in fact, the poor would have access to the same truth of the person of Jesus who came to save sinners, rich and poor, smart and simple. Listen to me, self-righteous, which some of us are, let's be honest, all of us are to some degree, and the prodigal. Luke wanted this on the stage of world history because it was historically there, but Luke also wanted it on the stage of world history because it is for the world to hear about this Jesus. There is salvation under no other name than the name of Jesus. Now, as we get into this, I want you to consider the sources. Notice verse 1. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, he continues on, but I want to stop here for a second just to note, listen, Luke is a historian here. Yes, he's a doctor by trade, but he's a historian. He's an investigative historian. And as a good historian, Luke is concerned with the facts. Notice the fact that he's already aware of many who have undertaken to compile a narrative of things. Luke's going through it all. You got a narrative in that day about what had happened with Jesus with people that were contemporaries of Jesus? Luke had looked at it. It's really important to understand, and sometimes we can get away from, with this or from this, Christianity is a religion that is based on fact, historical fact, not a feeling, not a warm burning in your bosom, I came and I felt this mystical experience. No, 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 we're talking about a real, actual person named Jesus 
who really actually was truly God and truly man, who really actually lived a perfect life for you, really actually died a death in your place, really actually was buried, really actually rose from the dead, and then really actually ascended to the right hand of God where he ever lives to make intercession for you and plead the blood of his cross for sinners like us until we're brought home to be with him. This is what Luke is declaring here. Luke is concerned with the facts, but it's more than the facts. Notice the way he says this, and as many as undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. That is loaded language, y'all. This is not like um, merely an account of the life of Jesus. This been accomplished verb is an intensive word and it is passive indicating that something beyond simply the account of Jesus' life is being described by Luke here. Rather, something significant in the account of Jesus' life was fulfilled in that life of Jesus. Namely, what I believe Luke is going to get at is we have in the account that Luke gives us the very fulfillment of something significant in human history through Jesus Christ. And I think he's gonna point to two things. In Jesus, we have the fulfillment of Israel's scriptures, the Old Testament, and in Jesus, we have the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. Yeah, Josephus wrote a history that should be considered for the Jews. Luke wrote a history that should be considered for the redemptive work of God in salvation through Jesus Christ. Been accomplished among us because this is whose work? God's work. This is God's saving work through Jesus, and Luke has investigated all of it. In fact, no one writes a more extensive, more comprehensive history of Jesus than Luke. And if you take Luke Acts, you get 60 years, right? From the birth of John the Baptist all the way to the proclamation of the gospel going to Rome by the end of Acts. Luke wrote that all. And he says it's worth being on the shelf with the greats because it is so historically accurate. Do you believe that this morning? Then let it put steel in your spine. Why are you so silent? We have good news to proclaim. Why don't you sing like we should sing if your savior is the one who rose from the dead? You know what I'm saying, y'all? Like, let's start asking ourselves. I see so many heads nodding. Let's keep pressing into that. Listen, I'm not challenging you in a negative way. I'm just going, there is more. We can't ever possibly give away, like, what would be sufficient for what we have in Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it could look crazy to the world, and we haven't given away but a smidgen in comparison to what we have in Jesus Christ. Second thing Luke wants us to stand convinced of, not just the historicity of the gospel, but he wants us to stand convinced of the humility of Luke's gospel. I want you to stand convinced of the humility of Luke's gospel. I want you to consider Luke for a moment with me, and then we'll talk about the eyewitnesses here in verse 2. Luke was clearly educated, right? It's always talked about like, oh, those guys, are, you know, we just have this like chronological snobbery. The older we get in history, the dumber we are. I am totally convinced we are way dumber. <laughs> Honestly, read the old books. That's why we're like, I can't even read one of these books. It's like, that's a bridge, bro. That's abridged. You can't handle that old stuff. So I know we think we're soup smart. We're not. I think we've gotten dumber. That's just my side note. <laughs> Welcome to Doxa. We're glad that you're here. <laughs> Colossians 4 calls Luke a physician. He's a doctor. Verse 14. Not only a doctor, he's a beloved physician. This guy was loved. This guy was like, hey, where should I go? Hey, I'm new in town. Where should I go? You should go to Luke. He's the best. He's the man. He's a very good physician. Luke not only was a physician, but he was responsible for writing a third of the New Testament. Do we realize that? Just Luke and Acts is a third of the New Testament, a little less, okay? Someone's going to be like, it's 27%. Eh, well. all right. Email that to cridder at doxa.church, all right? <laughs> 
Sorry, I gave, them away, I gave away your email. <laughs> Just kidding, we give those away. In spite of all of this stuff, Luke being this physician, beloved, clearly well accepted, a writer of a third of the New Testament, what you'll find so interesting about the book of Luke is that nowhere in the book of Luke does he ever refer to himself. He was content to be humbly hidden behind the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't even fit in our concept this, these days. You know, if you were on the front end of something like this, what about your book deals, right? What about your speaking gigs? What about your conference circuits, right? You're going to turn this into cash. Luke never speaks of himself. He was so content to be beautifully overshadowed by the weight and worth of the one that he was writing about. Something had captivated Luke. Listen, we've been witnesses to things before, but it hasn't claimed our lives like it, Jesus claimed their lives. Right? I've seen an amazing sporting event, okay? but I didn't like become an evangelist for that sporting event. Sure, maybe a little bit afterwards. You see that play? It was amazing. And then you move on because your team loses, and it just, you, know, you hope for that time. If you live in Sacramento, your team loses a lot, but not, I guess, anymore. We're getting better. This is good. But to be so wrapped up that you would just gladly throw your life at someone says something, right? It's not just Luke, though. Consider those whom he investigated. Look at verse 2. So inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. Now understand here, in the Greek, eyewitnesses and ministers are held together by one article, the, that holds that phrase grammatically together such that they're one and the same group. Just as those who from, I, from the beginning were eyewitnesses, they also became ministers of the word. Now that's Luke's phrase for the Christian message, the gospel. You'll hear him use the word as a phrase in the book of Acts as well. He's talking about the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Jesus Christ for sinners like us. He's going... The ones who saw it became ministers of this one. They were so overwhelmed. Listen, this is how they explained it in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, also written by Luke, that they were servants who could not but speak of what they had seen and heard. Whatever they had seen and heard, they could not not be a servant of it. And all they cared about was getting the word. Authoritatively, seen by them, testified to Luke, who under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit compiles this inerrant, sufficient, historical, and humble account, all pointing to the glory of Jesus Christ. They just wanted to, the word is deliver, which is just this technical term for give it to them exactly as they witnessed it. Man, what does that say about the greatness of Jesus? We hate being eclipsed by someone else. You hate when you deserve a promotion and you don't get it. You don't like when you don't win a sporting event and you feel like someone else didn't really deserve it. And there's one who comes in who's so great, they witness something so glorious in the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Jesus Christ that they can't help but joyfully give themselves to testifying to that truth. This Jesus is different. Someone greater than Solomon is here. Stand convinced by the humility of Luke's gospel. Number three, Stand convinced by the credibility of Luke's gospel. Stand convinced by the credibility of Luke's gospel. In light of the work that he had seen of many who had compiled these narratives and accounts, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. It seemed good to me. He's saying it seemed suitable. It seemed noble. Why did it seem that way? Well, I had all this information, Luke's saying. I had done the investigation. 
I had done the organization. I had followed it all myself closely such that I could put this account together for this Theophilus guy. Who, who is this guy? Well, first of all, let me just say that while it was written to Theophilus specifically, and I think you'll understand why when I describe him a little bit, it was definitely not intended uniquely for Theophilus. It was intended for anyone, anyone, and everyone that would be willing to read it. It was for you. Anyone willing to give it any serious thought, it was for you. It was never meant to stay with Theophilus, but it did start with him. Now, Theophilus, what do we know about him? He is a mysterious figure, guys. We don't know much about him from Scripture. He's mentioned here in Acts 1.1. That's it. He's called most excellent, which if you read the account of the book of Acts, is also attributed to Felix and to Festus. So he's clearly some sort of prominent official, which I think just means he's got the cash. All right? Money sign. He paid for this project. And you go, oh, come on, man. It's 24 chapters. I mean, I know it's long. I know you're going to preach it long, but it's not that long. A work like that in the first century was extremely expensive. And Theophilus is likely the one that was paying for this to be done. His name means lover of God. Theo, God, phileo, lover, lover of God. His name was that. So I don't know if that was his actual name or that's what he went by, but most likely he was a God-fearing Gentile. Luke was a God-fearing Gentile. And he had evidently heard about Jesus from the best we can gather. He had heard about the accounts and Luke goes, I just want to make sure that everything, I, I want to do the work, right? I want you to leave convinced. I'm going to do it for you, all right? I'm going to give you a reliable account so you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt this Jesus that you follow is who he says he is. And then Theophilus through that goes to the world, to any who would listen. Now, praise God, Luke wrote Luke. You go, well, I, I've read the other gospel accounts. Do you know how much material is unique to Luke thanks to his investigative journal, uh, historical account, journalism, whatever you want to call it? First of all, Luke's the longest gospel. That's why we're going to be in it for two and a half years. But Luke didn't just copy Matthew. You just copy Mark. You know, like, oh, look what I did. You're like, bro, <laughs> plagiarism, right? It's not that. He invested, you, you bet he talked to Matthew? Bet he talked to Mark? You think he maybe talked to Mary? Love to get your account on the virgin birth. I would so want to be a fly on that wall. There is material in Luke that isn't in Matthew, Mark, or John. Almost half of Luke's material is unique to his gospel. There are 35 miracles in the gospels, seven miracles only in Luke, such that if you didn't have Luke, we wouldn't have an account of seven unique miracles. 50 parables in the gospels across the board. 27 find themselves in Luke. 18 are only in Luke. 18 parables of the Lord Jesus. And about 30 events in the life of Jesus are recorded by Luke that no one else does. It's reminded me all week. I, I loved when Lord of the Rings came out, but I really love when the extended version came out. With Luke, we have like the extended version of the story, the actual history of the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have the DVD, DVD. <laughs> Do I have to define that now that I've said it? I'm dating myself. Praise God, there's finally come a day where I'm dating myself. We're looking at something live stream, all right, that has extra bits of the story to round out this sufficient account of Jesus, not more, not less, under superintendence of the Holy Spirit, exactly this to give us this absolutely necessary account from a Gentile's writing, no less, about Jesus. So Luke has unique material, but I also want to add this. You have to consider Luke's Old Testament effort. <laughs> this guy put the effort in. 
Again, he's a Gentile. I, I think of, I don't even, don't even answer this question. How well do you think you know the Old Testament? It's like, you're just glad I read it once a year, hopefully, which is probably a small percentage. And every time you read it, you're like, it's not getting any better. <laughs> I don't know. Still weird. I still just read it. I get to Jesus, I understand it a bit more, right? Luke was a Gentile, and the amount of Old Testament effort he does, he, he, he brings into his work. Let, let, me, let me tell you why I mean this. Where am I getting this from in the text? It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely, he says, to write an orderly account. You know what that means? It conveys the idea of logical order. Luke has a logical order to his account. Not strictly chronological. Though most of it is chronological. But when Luke wants to make a point, a theological point, he puts material around to support that point. He wants you to see something about Jesus. He wants you to testify that, uh, to the world. He wants to testify that what happened here is more than what maybe meets the eye. It's maybe even more than what the Jewish people were picking up on from how it was understood in the Old Testament as a prophecy to be fulfilled in the Messiah. And so Luke makes these points when he needs to. Luke uses more than 30 explicit Old Testament quotations in the Gospel of Luke and several hundred allusions, not bad for a Gentile, amen? But he did his homework. And Luke keeps his readers acquainted with the Old Testament throughout his Gospel. We're going to be acquainted with the Old Testament throughout the Gospel. We're going to learn the Old Testament better, and we're going to see in Jesus Christ the fulfillment of the whole of the Old Testament. Can I just read you how Jesus is described by Luke, the Gentile writer of this Gospel? You want some verses, I'll give them to you, but let me just show you this. Luke presents Jesus as the long-awaited, virgin-born son of King David. Luke presents Jesus as the last Adam and the true Israel of God. Luke presents Jesus as the Messiah, announcing the eschatological year of the Jubilee. Luke presents Jesus as the rejected prophet of Israel, as Yahweh incarnate who redeems his people in the second exodus and leads his people to the promised land of the new creation. Jesus is presented as the new Moses who testifies to the kingdom lifestyle that is radically oriented around loving God and loving people. Luke presents Jesus as Daniel, son of man, Isaiah's suffering servant, the new temple, the resurrected one, and the great interpreter of Israel's scriptures. This is how Luke presents Jesus. And as we go in the story, you're going to see this pick up. You're going to be blown away that what you once saw, which seemed cool on the surface, was actually a greater picture of how Jesus himself is the fulfillment of what the Old Testament scriptures spoke of. And Luke did his homework for you so that you could see it in all his glory so that you wouldn't stay quiet and your worship would exalt the Lord Jesus Christ more than you ever have before. That some of you here who don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior would come to know him as Lord and Savior. Come to know him as the sovereign God of the universe and the son of man who came in the lineage of Adam to save broken sinners like you and me, not just Israel, but the world. For anyone who would turn from their sin and place their confidence, their faith, their trust in the person of Jesus and who he is and what he's done, they would wrap themselves up in Jesus. They would invest nothing in what their human effort could supply. They realize their efforts are worthless, that their sin is plentiful, that there's nothing you could do. But Jesus has come to do what you couldn't do to die where you should die, to rise to give you the gift that you could not otherwise obtain of salvation and eternal life and reconciled relationship with God through Jesus, available to you by faith today. If you would trust in him, put your faith in him, hold fast to him in confidence. Stand convinced, church, by the credibility of Luke's gospel. Stand convinced by its historicity. Stand convinced by its humility. And last, stand convinced by the content of Luke's gospel. Stand convinced by the content of Luke's gospel. No surprise, we've already read this. 
He finishes, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. He wants you to have certainty. He wants you to have firmness. He wants to make some of you bold. Er. Or let's be honest, at all for some of us. And a step in the er direction would be a win. It would at least be more accurate to the one that you worship. Luke writes this to be believed. He writes this so that you would understand the truth as it is in Jesus concerning the things that have been taught. What are those things? Well, I have a few minutes. I thought I would run through. Would it be nice just to have an overview of the book of Luke in like five minutes? I'm going to give it to you anyway, so. (laughs) If you said, no, I'd like to leave early, this is definitely not the church for you. (laughs) Delighted that you're here. Luke travels this journey from the cradle to the cross to the crown with Jesus. You break up the book in four parts. Chapters one to three is all about Jesus' birth and baptism. You see John the Baptist's birth, and this is a great event, but what he's trying to point out to you, Luke, that is, is that Jesus' birth was greater in every way. That he's described by people in a way that only the God of the Israel scriptures was described. He's described as God, and yet he's man. He's the savior of mankind, and his genealogy goes back not to Abraham, but to Adam. Showing us that he's the savior of sinners, not just to Abraham, the Israelites, but to Adam, all man. The second break is chapters 4 through chapter 9, verse 50. And this section is all about Jesus' wilderness temptations and ministry in Galilee. These chapters talk about how Jesus' messianic reign is executed. Jesus is the one who defeats Israel's enemies. They're just bummed because he's defeating Satan, not Rome. He goes to the wilderness to be tempted, and Jesus was successful in the wilderness where Israel failed. He goes to Nazareth where he is rejected as a prophet which makes way for the Gentiles to be accepted in God's plans of salvation and then to Galilee where Jesus performs 21 miracles in the third gospel demonstrating the inbreaking of the kingdom and the new age. Key part of that is the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus asserts that kingdom lifestyle that goes for those who belong to him. Then probably the most unique part of the Gospel of Luke is Luke chapter 9, verse 51 to Luke 19, verse 27, which is Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. How about that for some alliteration? What's interesting is the other Gospel writers cover this, but Luke covers this in a significant way. He spends a third of his narrative talking about Jesus going to Jerusalem. Jesus going to Jerusalem. Jesus going to Jerusalem. Jesus going to Jerusalem. Because you know what's in Jerusalem? That cross he's going to die on. He wants you to see it's the cross. Jesus, Jesus dies on a cross for sinners. And he's like, what was it, Luke 9, 51, he set his face towards Jerusalem, right? It's when you get to the end of Luke 19 or Luke 19, verse 10, I think that it says that Jesus came to seek and save sinners. He does it on the cross. And Luke's like, listen, Focus, I'm telling you, this is it. Everything's on the cross. Everything you need is found in the cross. All the freedom that you need, all the deliverance that you need, all the forgiveness for sins that you need is found in the cross, and he just makes this beeline to it. And then the fourth section, Jesus' death and resurrection, you actually see the event take place in Luke 19, 28 to 24, 53, and we get the amazing account of Luke and the road of Emmaus where he, he shows the disciples I want to be in that Bible study. I'm sorry for all the classes going on in the fall. If Jesus was like, you want to be in my Bible study? I'll tell you about how all of this fulfills the Old Testament scriptures. I'm going to be in that class. Anyone else? You you don't have to raise raise your hand. It's going to hurt feelings. Frankly, if, yeah, never mind. Let's quit while I'm ahead. Um, Demonstrating that his life, his death, his resurrection fulfills the whole sweep of redemptive history at the end and this amazing interaction with Jesus, which is the very point that Luke sought out at the beginning to bring to us. So you have this amazing span of the book of Luke. It's going to be an amazing series, guys. But one of the things that I want to close with is, and when I say close, I don't mean necessarily your your notebooks, because I know what that's like. It's a longer close than you would think. 
I take that back. Now you're probably thinking, no, that's about right. It closes, I could see this being long. <laughs> what does this do for our hearts? What does this do for our hearts? If we think about our heart and we break it down, what's the heart, right? It's not the thing beating in our chest. And the Bible uses the heart primarily. It's talking about the inner man. Four components of your heart, your mind, your conscience, your will, and your passions. Mind, conscience, will, passions. What's the heart? The inner man, composed of the mind, conscience, will, and passions. Mind, conscience, will, and passions. Mind, conscience, will, and passions. <laughs> if I say it a lot, then you can write it. Yep. Let me give you something that it does for each one of those. Mind, conscience, will, and passions. For the mind, it brings clarity, guys. Brings clarity. What should this do? What should this account of Jesus do? This is the truth about Jesus is how it should be understood. Luke makes no mistake about this. And Paul writes to Timothy, this truth about Jesus is to make us wise unto salvation through faith, and I'll add faith alone in Jesus Christ. For your mind, this is meant to bring you clarity. This is the truth of Jesus. For your conscience, it's meant to bring conviction. It's meant to bring conviction. This is to be believed in. More than that, it's to be defended. More than that, it's to be rested in. More than that, this is to dust away the cobwebs of doubt and for some of you, regain your convictional footing again in your Christian faith. Some of you need this. Some of you need to be encouraged in this way. There's no shame here. This is an opportunity. Listen, Jesus is a wonderfully gracious Savior. This is for an opportunity for some of you bent over and cowering in your fear of what someone may say to you or think about you because you're a Christian. Stand strong, loved ones. Believe your Bible is real. You don't have man's musings in your hand. You have the account of Luke, the faithful, credible historian inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us an infallible and sufficient account of the Lord Jesus. Number three, it brings holiness to the will. Holiness to the will. The truth is tied intimately to your sanctification. John 17 would say, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. As we learn the truth, may the gospel first dwell in our hearts by faith as a free gift of God's grace, and then once it's in us, the gospel would make its way through us, through every part of who we are. And I pray that would take place in this series, and then finally in the passions, that it would bring boldness In our passions, it would bring passion. Go figure. That you'd be like, no, this is true. And because this is true, we'll preach it with boldness like the apostles preach. You know what they talk about the apostles in the book of Acts? How'd they preach? With boldness. With boldness. Go read Luke's second account. With boldness. With boldness. With boldness. Let's do it, church. Let's stand convinced by the historicity of Luke's gospel, by the humility of Luke's gospel, by the credibility of Luke's gospel, and the content of Luke's gospel. It's going to be fun. Bring your friends every week. It's going to be wild. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the gift of the gospel of Luke. What a privilege it is to have your word and to know your word and not that we would just know your word, but we would know the Savior who is reflected in your word. God, may it be, bring us to a place of absolute undoneness. Be the one to whom we carry all of our sorrows, all of our shame, all of our trials. Lord, save sinners by drawing them to yourself that they might exercise faith in the person and work of Jesus for the good of their souls, the forgiveness of their sins, and the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.